The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session with Chris McCann that took place on Friday, October 25th, 2019. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Friday night question and answer program. Tonight, we're going to open up the room to take your call, and each person is invited to call in and share what's ever on your mind. Now, um, I saw there were several calls lined up, but um, I believe they were knocked out. So if you called in previously, you're, you're going to have to call in again. There's a couple people that uh, I can see, but uh, if, if you were knocked out, you will have to call back in. And we'll be glad to take your call, and I'll try to respond as much as possible by going to the Bible, which is God's holy word. And it is there we find answers to our questions according to the Lord's perfect will, as far as what he would desire and will to open up to the understanding of his people. And, of course, our own individual limitations, but we ask God for wisdom, we ask for his help, and we just follow the method that he has laid out, the biblical hermeneutic of comparing scripture with scripture, and we have a good expectation that he will guide us into truth. Okay, let's go to the first person on the phone tonight. Welcome to our program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. Um, we know that Jesus is called he has the name Son because of the resurrection from uh, the dead and, and, and at the foundation of the world um, in in Romans one. Um, how what, I'm trying to see what you think about why is the Father called the Father? Well, I think that it would um, tie back to the same point in eternity past when Jesus became the son that's when as you mentioned let me let me read that in Romans 1 this is when uh, really that declaration is made in Romans 1 verse 4 and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead so we know Jesus is the prototype. He is the firstborn from the bit, from the dead, the Bible insists. He's the first to die, the first to rise from the dead, and it is through his resurrection that, that he becomes God's firstborn son. And... Well, uh, we wonder, was God the Father before he had his firstborn son? Well, no more than any man would be a father before he had a son or a daughter. You know, we, we could have expectation or hopes of being a father, but it's not until we get married um, and, and God blesses the marital relations, and then a child comes, we're a father. You have to have a child before you can be a father. And, and so, yes, I think the Bible is teaching not only the point where Jesus receives the name Son, but also the point in which the Father becomes the Father. And that's in eternity past, which we can't fathom. Uh, our minds aren't able to really comprehend existence uh, without time. But, but we do know as the foundation of the world, the world was not created. Time was not created. So it had to have happened in eternity, at, at a point in eternity. That's why... Um, you know, I always try to use a word that doesn't identify with time. And, and I don't know how there's a progression 
in eternity without time. But at some point in eternity past is when this happened. And we also have verses <clears throat> that that tell us that um, I have loved you with an everlasting love or the mercy of Jehovah is upon his people from everlasting to everlasting. And that can only mean that the the atone the atonement, the atoning work of Christ was performed from everlasting. And and of course the next question would be, well, you know, um if God wasn't the Father and Jesus wasn't the Son until that point in eternity past, what were they before? And before when we say before and after, we mean a point in time and and I don't know how to look at eternity with the idea of before. How do you get before everlasting? And and I don't know if, again, our, our little finite minds can uh, reason that out. Yeah, yeah, you start getting into the Trinity. Um, how about First uh, John 5, 7? How does that... First John 5, 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Um, it's true. Christ is the Word. The Word was made flesh. We, we read in John 1, in John chapter 1, in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. And, and, and so I think I have said before that, that Christ was, was the word and became the son but i think it's better not to try and get into that because of what i just said that when we look at these other statements the only way we can look at it is in reference to time we understand things happening at a point in time and we also understand before that particular point in time and after that particular point in time which are also their ideas that that involve time before and after with our minds but this is a point a, they don't apply to a, they don't apply to eternity <laughs> right it's a point in eternity that god has already said when we when we look at uh jeremiah i think it was jeremiah 31 3 or 4 I have loved you with an everlasting love. And when we look, uh, search out the word loved, um, we, we see in Galatians 2.20, Paul says that, um, that, that uh, Christ has um, loved him and, and given himself or gave himself for him. So the love of God has to do with the atonement and, and therefore the statement an everlasting I have loved you with an everlasting love relates to a completed atonement that that took place in eternity past and that's why um, Psalm 103 I think let me turn there in Psalm 103 it says if it's the right Psalm yeah, Psalm 103, verse 17. But the mercy of Jehovah is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. And how uh, we, we understand God's mercy is upon us to everlasting, that is into the future, forever and ever and ever, because we've received eternal life, we'll live forever and ever and ever because of that mercy, but how is the mercy of Jehovah upon us from everlasting? It can only be upon us when we understand Christ is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And when we look into that idea that the death of Christ, when it was not, when the world existed, that means it was in eternity. It doesn't and again, we tend to think, well, from the foundation of the world, Christ died, then God created the world. 
because we're thinking time sequence. But no, uh, no, at, at any point in eternity past, whether even if we were to think the, the moment, which is a time word, before God created, that that's when Christ died. That's still eternity because there there was no sun, moon, and stars. Uh, there were no timekeepers or celestial clock. And and if it was in eternity, how does God reckon eternity? And and that's where we we can't get into. We um, just don't know how to keep track of time when there is no time. And that's because we're creatures of time, and that's how our minds think. That That's how we're programmed. We, we can't think in terms without time. But thank you. Right. Thank okay, you for Chris. calling and sharing. Yeah. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Friday night question and answer program. Please, go ahead with your call. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to read uh, Revelation 9, 5a. Oh, uh, Revelation 9, verse 5, the first part of the verse. Okay, yeah, yeah. it says, And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. Uh, and then also... Revelation fourteen twenty. Revelation fourteen twenty says, "And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs." Right. A couple of things. Uh, it's been about eight and a half or nine years since I last listened to an open forum program, but uh, I believe there used to be discussion regarding when the Lord went to the cross, whether it was a Friday or a Thursday. Um, I believe he used to say that it was on Friday. Uh, but anyhow, uh, my question, I know we, we don't need to prematurely uh, nail down a date in this time of judgment uh, going forward. Uh, I'm sure the Lord will provide the information for the exact timing, but um, I just was wondering, because I heard you last Sunday, uh, I think you said something about uh, April 14th, and um, I don't know if I'm doing it something wrong, but when I, when I figured um, that these, this um, five months, and the 1600, uh, it comes out to 8,000. 8, um, well, I see that it lands actually on a Friday, or it would be 8,000 days from May 21. I, I'm just saying each time I do it, and maybe it's something I'm not doing correctly, but I'm showing that it comes out on a Friday, which is April 15th. And, um, and then also, I was just thinking that he could have went to the cross on possibly April 15th in the year 33 A.D. And then, um, and that could have been on a Friday, or on Friday, and then 2,000 years later, it would be uh, possibly uh, April 15th of uh, the year 2033. Well, uh, actually... Uh, we know that when Christ went to the cross in 33 A.D., it the it was Friday, April 1st, and okay. we we know that um, uh, there there was actually um, there's there's a way of coming to correct dates where you can just uh, project uh, based on the lunar calendar and the number of days in a year and uh, I think it was in 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 the booklet um, another infallible proof that number of 722,500 days that um, 
Uh, what was the numbers it broke down to? Uh, let me. Let me Ten, uh, 5 times 10 times 17 times 5 times 10 times 17. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it uh, was a duplicate number of breaking down from April 1st until May 21. It was 522,500 days. And when you break that number down, it was, uh, I think you're right, 5 times 10 times 17. And 5 would be the number of atonement. 10 completeness and 17 heaven and then it doubled so so it was 5 times 10 times 17 times 5 times 10 times 17 and that really you know those kind of numbers I, I know there's people who scoff and um, they mock the whole idea of, of breaking down numbers but breaking down numbers is biblical uh, we we can look to the Bible in Revelation uh, where at one point God says there's 12 gates and then he says there's three on the north, three on the south, three on the east, three on the west. So God just broke down the number 12 three times four or, or four times three. And, and um, there's other examples too where God breaks down numbers in the Bible and and so um, we we know that that we're um, not doing something we shouldn't be doing. But there's when when God does something like that, it really gives permission to do it. And and so when we see these key numbers appear, especially on a date when when a key number like that shows up on a date that other information is locking in like the 7,000 years from the flood coming to that particular date, May 21, 2011, because it had the 17th day of the second month as the underlying Hebrew calendar date, then you have that, that precision of the 722,500 coming from the day Christ was on the cross. It's very powerful and it strengthens the other dates. Now that's something also I've tried looking at an extension of the 722,500 by adding 8,000 or other dates within the year 2033. You know, there's there's different ways from different points we can count to see if there's an, a certain day that would have that kind of weight, you know, a uh, evidence falling on it just like there's a certain year and we have all these time paths going to 2033 that separates that year from other years if we start seeing evidence concerning a day and and the evidence can build to the point where uh, where it becomes weighty then we can say yes just as we did with May 21 2011 this is the the date that the biblical evidence is pointing to. But right now there's two possibilities and I was trying to look for uh, a note. I think it it is on uh, my Facebook page. Okay, I have I do have April 14th uh, in 8,000 days inclusively. So maybe maybe that's why uh, wow. you had to go to the next day. So it right. it's in, it's inclusive if you count inclusively, it's eight thousand right. days till April fourteenth, and if you go to October, if you start from September seventh, nineteen ninety four, and you go to October fifteenth, which is either the last day or next to the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, depends on how you count the last day. Remember we saw some biblical language to point it to the ninth day, and I think October 15th is the eighth day, but but that's 14,283 days, and that breaks down, I think, in from September 7th, 94, which is the, the first day of the latter rain, um, and so this would cover the whole 39 actual years, 40 years inclusive period, 
that that uh, God is a, the the official judgment starting with that latter rain period, going to the conclusion of the judgment on the world. Uh, the fourteen thousand two eighty three breaks down to three times three times three times twenty three times twenty three. So that is uh, another date to keep in mind. But you know, we just keep praying and and checking this out like we check out everything and see if sure. see if there's more evidence that that will arise. But thank you for calling and sharing. And now we'll go to the next person on the phone tonight. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Good study you were talking about how um, Isaac and Rebecca were were laughing because it is judgment day and and uh, Satan doesn't have any control and or anything to say about it. The people that are lost and uh, we're living in the judgment day. Uh, two places. Uh, could you go to uh, Proverbs 3 and read verse 24 and 25? And then I'll take you to another place. Proverbs 3, 24 says, When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. Okay, so we know that's the time we're, we're living in and the desolation of the wicked during Judgment Day. Now could you go to Daniel chapter 11? Daniel 11. Yeah, and read uh, verse 33. And Daniel 11, 33. 34. Uh -huh. 33 and 34. Okay, it says, and, yeah. they, and they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword, and by flame, by captivity, and by spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be holpen with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. Okay, now there's two things within this. The one with the flame, I wondered to know they will fall. That means the, the believers are are being tripped up, so to speak, and by the sword and by the flame. Is it the believers that are that are falling by the flame? And what's the flame? And and then well, yeah, uh, they they uh, notice there's four things: sword, flame, captivity, spoil, and that's. I think God calls maybe those very same things as four sword judgments. In Ezekiel 14, it says in Ezekiel 14, in verse 21, For thus saith the Lord Jehovah, How much more when I send my four sword judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword and the famine and the noisome beast and the pestilence. So it's it's different, different um judgments but still for to cut it off from man and beast and I, I Chris yeah yeah I'm, I don't know if I have it clear so in uh, verse 33 uh, who's falling there is it the believers or is it, uh, is it the people that are being judged and then the and then the, the believers will get a little help and but many will cleave to them with flattery oh. so yeah, uh, the, you know, I, I was thinking it, that in Revelation nine, it I, I the yeah, unbeliever I, wants to wants to be born again. The unbeliever in Revelation nine wants to be born again, but he can't because it's Judgment Day. So, but many are kind of wondering maybe if they could get in, you know, what whether yeah. subconsciously or consciously. Well, but is well, the flame? It, what does the it, flame? The problem stand with in Daniel eleven. The, believers? the problem yeah. with Daniel eleven is it's it, it's very complicated chapter that um, I've never heard anyone work through, not Mr. Camping or anyone, that that um, leads up to these statements. Now, we could read from verse 31, and it says, An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. We know exactly what's in view. It's the great tribulation. It, it's 
the judgment on the churches and the taking away the daily identifies with the light of the gospel. So God departs out of the church. The abomination is set up. And we know from Matthew 24, when you see the abomination standing in the holy place, then let those within Judea flee to the mountain. So we understand all that. Is that, is that, and let's read verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be, shall he corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And that could fit in with the latter reign, with the worldwide proclamation, Judgment Day, May 21. Certainly, the people that knew their God were strong at that time and did do exploits, uh, it, even though that's italicized, the translators are trying to help us. And, uh, and we know that fits along with the daily leaving the church and the abomination being set up in the church. Then it says in verse 33, And they that understand among the people, which ties in with Daniel 12, that you know the word will be sealed up till the time of the end, and then God says, The, the wise will understand, but none of the wicked will understand. So that also fits in with the Great Tribulation as well as Judgment Day that we're presently in. They that understand among the people shall instruct many, which fits with the second part of the Great Tribulation, the latter rain. The whole world practically heard. All the elect did become saved through biblical instruction, through the hearing of the, the warning of the trumpet sound. Yet they shall fall by the sword, by flame, by captivity, by spoil, many days. So that, that could apply, possibly, to God's judgment on the church, which did impact the elect as we came out of the churches and congregations. Or this could identify with the statement of Matthew 24, 29, immediately after the tribulation, what happens? The sun is dark and the moon does not give its light and the stars fall. The stars fall from heaven. And who do the stars represent? God's, God's elect. So we, we understand the sun darkening points to the going out of the light of the gospel, the moon, uh, of course, the sun is Christ, the moon, the word of God, which reflects the light of the sun, the light of God, is also not giving its light unto salvation. And the stars, we should not think of the actual universe. This is speaking of a spiritual heaven that the Word of God established where the lights of the gospel were in place. And that's why Revelation 6 in the Day of Judgment says it's rolled up like a scroll letting us know the Bible's in view. And, and, and so the stars were the elect also in place the the little lights we see from the earth we see the the sun and the moon as the big lights and the stars as those little lights pointing to the fact that we're messengers of the gospel and and we were light bearers light carriers and and, and so the whole idea of the stars falling is that the elect children of God do not carry a message of evangelization or light of the gospel to the dark world whereby we would give any kind of hope that they might be saved. So that's primarily what it has in view. But we know because we've gone through it, there was a period of time where... Um, the the church seemed victorious. They they were rejoicing over the idea of no man knows, locking hands with the world, who were scoffing and mocking and and basically saying, oh, we knew there was no God, nothing to worry about, and and you know they they were with their partners in the church, both saying something different, 
but really in in agreement in their relief that this thing did not happen you know was such a serious desperate warning made to the world it frightened them to the core <clears throat> but but then for a, a time we can remember the confusion what's going on what are we to do some people are saying no more teachers don't talk about the gospel anymore don't do this don't do that just kind of uh, we're, we're going to be here we don't know why just basically stay in your house and and don't say anything and and so there was very awful confusion yet God helped us with a little help and you know I I, I pray this prayer uh, basically from this verse uh, so I should be more familiar with it than I am but I, I pray it a lot because I understand we are being severely tested by God at this time and so we've come before his judgment seat we're making an appearance it's a demonstration but he is still a just judge we're all approaching him and 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 so we should not expect God to help as he has in times past when there was a war going on kingdom against kingdom and and there was deliverance of souls that that had to be delivered and so God would open up great and effectual doors to send forth the gospel and we witnessed it with with the latter rain and 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 in order to save the last of the elect but we can pray God um, may you help me with a little help and we can be encouraged by that prayer because God's little help is more help than all the world could give if they were willing to help us which they're not so you know just think of the the um, all-powerful nature of God and if he is looking favorably upon us and he of course he is he can help us and we can look to the book of Daniel when Daniel is thrown into the lion's den God's the one who is teaching us there are the elect and and they must uh, experience the judgment we have to see uh, we have to try them we have to see will they be able to make it through and endure to the end so circumstances allowed them to happen whereby Daniel was accused falsely thrown into the pit and had to pass the night in the lion's den and and yet God was helping him wasn't it? On one hand, we might look and say, where's God? Daniel was so faithful. Why isn't God helping him? And and you see, but down in the pit, who shut the, the lion's mouths? And Daniel recognizes that as soon as the king comes first thing in the morning. And that reminds us when, when Christ rose early Sunday morning, we can expect the first available instant which the biblical evidence is pointing to in the year 2033 when God completes this judgment he will come urgently to take his people out and to lift them up and Daniel told the king that that God had shut the lions mouths because innocency was found uh, in him just as innocency is is within everyone that God has saved because no sin is upon us so it, you know we we don't know we maybe can't see and and if uh, we happen to be the one in a pit that where there's it's it's all dark and and lions are brushing up against us hungry lions and it's about as uncomfortable a situation as anybody could imagine we may not realize that hey day after day after day after day this is going on and I'm still here I should have been devoured long ago but I'm still here well with Daniel it would have been hour after hour after hour but with us in this prolonged judgment period 
that's what we can we can look at and we can see and we can also see God is helping through the truth he's continuing to open up to us which tells us that he is aware that he is still uh, watching us caring for us he wants us to be fed feed my sheep is is the command of God for this time period it's his purpose that's why he told Peter three times to feed the sheep and so forth so we can see God's working and helping us during this time period now in verse 35 of Daniel 11 it says in some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed isn't that curious that God says that the time of the end for it is yet for a time appointed almost as as though he knew our present circumstances that we've been looking for the time of the end we were certain of the day of the end that this would be it and yet no though he tarry he will not tarry fits in with this statement but thank you for bringing up those verses in your question and I will go to the next person on the phone tonight welcome to our program please go ahead with your call Chris um, did the Lord use Ezra to write the book of Ezra Ezra because I heard someone say that someone else uh, God used another person of the Bible to write that book well as far as as Thank far you. as we know yeah as far as we know Ezra wrote Ezra um, now and Ezra was a priest who appears in the book of Nehemiah I think in Nehemiah well as Ezra is reading in Nehemiah 8 the book of the law but uh, we also are given information of how he came to Jerusalem um, well uh, maybe that's just where he shows up in Nehemiah I, maybe the other info is in Ezra but uh, I don't think there's any definitive statement in Ezra like we would read with some books where it becomes evident this is the the man that God used to write this book and and so we have no reason to doubt that Ezra wrote this and um, I as far as I know he did but thank you for your question and let's go now to our next caller tonight. Welcome to our program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. Uh, could you please read Ezra 6, verses 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21? And the elders of the Jews builded and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo and they builded and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes king of Persia and this house was finished on the third day of the month Adar which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king and then verse 21 says and the children of Israel which were come again out of captivity and all such as had separated themselves unto them from the filthiness of the heathen of the land to seek Jehovah God of Israel did eat thank you um, I made a note from one of mr. Camping's teachings and it says three names one king yes and 15 and then next to verse 21 where it says did eat it says uh, concordance number 398 to cause to eat and to feed with my question is are these verses referring to the great multitude in our day 
Well, you know, I've been looking at Ezra for a while, um, off and on, trying to understand it. Because if we follow chronologically, we know that the book of Ezra begins with the coming out of Babylon. And so the coming out of Babylon was after 70 years. And it, it is true in several other places in the Bible, when we come to the end of 70 years, it's a picture of the end of the Great Tribulation, and then the time after would be identified with Judgment Day. That's why I keep coming back to the book of Ezra to try and understand it. And the, see, the problem is that in Ezra, uh, they're laying the foundation of the temple, and they begin building for a time, and then the adversaries around them complain to one of the kings of, of the Medes and the Persians, even though they had an allowance from Cyrus. This apparently is a little later after Cyrus has ceased to be king, and, and uh, there's another king. And, and so that king causes them to stop building the temple. And you can see in the book of Haggai and the book of Zechariah, there's, there's uh, five books, other parts of, of some other books, but five main books that identify with the post-exilic period, as theologians call it, or the coming out of Babylon. Haggai, Zechariah, Ezra, Nehemiah, and parts of Daniel. And so the problem is, again, it's after the 70 years, and if that represents the, uh, the Day of Judgment, the whole idea of laying a foundation, building upon a foundation, completing a temple, as we know from Solomon's temple, points to the building up of the elect and and the the house of God, uh, whose house are we, and and so that does not seem to fit into a chronological. That is, if we continue to follow the history of Israel from the point of their leaving Babylon, in in some of these books, we run into problems, and. There, there's problems no matter which way you turn because there's they start to build, then there's a delay. And from what we can read, we're not told exactly how many years it was they were involved with the building initially before it stops. But there's a very long period of time where they're inactive, they're not building. And that's why Haggai addresses them as, as here they are in their houses and the, the house of the Lord lies waste. There, there's no activity. And then they rise up and build. And, and then there's another king of the Medes and the Persians, Darius, that it comes before and he does a search and he finds the original decree by Cyrus. And the point Mr. Camping was making about verse 14 that it, it says according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes. But the word commandment is singular, and from a casual reading, we would think this is three kings, so it should be commandments. But Mr. Camping points out commandment is singular, and king, it's Cyrus Dari and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia not kings. That also, to be grammatically correct, should be plural, if there were three kings. But it's one king that's in view, Cyrus, and the word an can be translated even. Cyrus, even Darius, even Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And, and, and so it's going back to the original decree from what we can read. You know, it's very certain when we look at these kings of the Medes and Persians, the way God has written about them, 
he has uh, camouflaged them, hidden them in many different ways where they they each have, they're actually not names, they're titles. And their descendants can have the same title. That's why when the temple's complete, uh, they begin to build again in the second year of Darius and complete it in his sixth year. It's a, it's a later Darius. And it, it very complicated, very confusing. And, and so that tells us there's a lot of information here that we can learn from. But, you know, there, uh, I don't want to <laughs> tell you my frustrations, but, but even if you were to look at the coming out of Babylon and, and the laying of the foundation as another period of time that identified with the gospel, you still run into problems. And, and, and so I, I just keep praying and hoping that the Lord will open up more information. Now, I don't know about the word eat. I don't know what the issue is there, but uh, I am familiar with these other things. But thank you for calling and sharing. And let's go to our last caller tonight. Welcome to our program. Please go ahead with your call. Yes, could you please read Romans 8, 16 and 17? Romans 8, 16 and 17 says... The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. When people asked a Bible teacher, the late brother Harold Camping, how to know we are a child of God, he would encourage us by bringing up Romans 8, verse 16, saying we can have assurance that we are a child of God when we agree increasingly with the word of God, the Bible. Now, an observation I have is verse 16 does not end with a period in its English translation, but rather in a colon. Thus, it is not complete unless complemented by the following verse, verse 17. Therefore, the suffering with Christ uh, seems to stand out for me. So could you please explain or give examples of suffering with Christ in our days? Yeah, I, I think you're making a good point that the Spirit beareth witness with our spirit, we are the children of God. And then the end of verse 17, if so be that we suffer with him, we may be also glorified together. And this would relate to Philippians 1, verse 29. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. And you could substitute for righteousness sake or the word's sake as we find it substituted in other places. And and so um, when God, for example, opens up information from his word and a doctrine comes forth like Sunday of the Sabbath or the faith of Christ or the end of the church age, these things, and okay, this is the word. Follow it. Follow me. And when we follow him, that is, follow the, the word of God, the teaching of the word of God, we are taking up our cross because as soon as we start following the word, there will be affliction of various sorts. And so there is where the suffering as a, a child of God comes in. And if we draw back, it will turn back away from the doctrine I mean there's there's all kinds of pressures to do that and there's some uh, temporary rewards too you know if you're you're off by yourself or if your family has ostracized you and and you're the oddball you're the guy who thinks the church age is over and, and none of it worked out as thought with May 21 2011 because that was all wrapped up with it and and here they're applying pressure and 
and when are you going to give that up? And it's easy. It's easy. Give in. Give in. Just go back. And yeah, the assault of men, the assault of the world will cease. But then you have a new enemy. You have God to deal with at that point because that's what we're faced with. Either we we please God and displease men or we please men and displease God. And, and that's always the test. And so we can live a comfortable life with men if we give in to the will of the Gentiles or we can have a good conscience with God and yet our life will be anything but comfortable there'll be a affliction for the word's sake and, and tribulation and so forth but thank you for bringing up these verses and I would like to thank everyone for joining us tonight I'm sorry if we weren't able to take your call uh, you can join us again Lord willing on Sunday afternoon 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time for our next live Bible question and answer program. But for now, good night, and may the Lord's perfect will be done. You've been listening to eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. You can hear these question and answer sessions Sunday afternoons following the Sunday studies and certain weeknights. Check eBibleFellowship.org for the latest schedule. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.